<laughs> I fully agree with you. I mean, yeah, I mean, I couldn't have said it better. Empaths and narcissists absolutely deserve each other. I mean, I've visited forums of self-styled, self-aggrandizing so-called empaths. And trust me, narcissists have a lot to learn from them. Narcissists have nothing on these people. I mean, they are more abusive than any abuser, abuser I've ever, ever come across, you know. Anyhow, I'm trying to remedy the situation with my very limited viewership. But I don't think it's working because empath feels good. I mean, it feels more morally superior. It feels like uh, you've been wronged. It's, it's a victim stance and a very rewarding victim stance. And there are many people who make a lot of money from the empath industry. They sell them books. They, they provide counseling. They, even academics have been swept into this craze and contaminated and corrupted by money. So you have professors of psychology and others who, who propagate this. Anyhow, listen, I, I got to go. I have a, a video to make. So thank you for the news and, and we'll be in touch. I call you. I call you on Thursday. I call you tomorrow. Okay, bye. Oh, there you are. I've been looking for you all over the place. Uh, so first of all, I owe you an apology. The, in one of my previous videos, I mentioned the book Laws of Human Nature, which I regard um, as a manual on how to become a psychopath, a successful psychopath. The author is Robert Greene, not Brian Greene. Brian Greene is a physicist, a respectable physicist. Robert Greene is the author of the, of the book. He also wrote The Art of Seduction and other How to Be a Psychopath and How to Be a Narcissist manuals. And he calls himself the new Machiavelli and he's exceedingly proud of it. Um, bizarre what people are proud of nowadays, but he is proud of this. So here's the correction. Robert Greene, not Brian Greene, and my humblest prostrate apologies to Brian Greene who is a great physicist and, and has popularized physics and science to a large extent. I've just been appointed as um, editor in the editor program of academia.edu. Academia.edu is the largest uh, academic portal in the world with more than 110 million professors as members. So I'm in the editor. I'm an editor now, and in the editorial board of Academia do Tedu. And of course, it gratifies me a lot. And I must say, I love this pandemic. It's exactly what the doctor ordered. Plus, I've been wearing a mask all my life. Hell, narcissist. The narcissist is the mask. There's nothing there. Take away the mask, and there's no face. You know the horror movies where there's this faceless entity walking the cor uh, creeping across the corridors and about to get you that's a narcissist there's only the mask narcissists are primed for this pandemic because they've been they have been masks they've not been wearing masks they have been masks all their lives you know of course that the word personality comes from the greek ancient greek word persona which means mask personality is a mask that we put forward there have been scholars like Jung and Goffman who describe how we put on a mask when we interact with other people. The difference between the narcissist and a healthy person is that a healthy person takes off the mask and then there's a person behind it. And the narcissist takes off the mask and there's nothing there. Okay, enough with this sophisticated uh, bladder dash. Today we're going to talk about narcissist, sex and other pretty titillating bits and pieces. Narcissists sexualize intimacy. They have something called sexual overperception. Now, mind you, all men have sexual overperception. Men tend to misinterpret female behavior and regard it as a sexual invitation. So if a woman is nice to you, if a woman is kind to you, if a woman brings you a gift for your birthday, it means she wants to have sex with you. This is the male brain. And it's called sexual overperception. But narcissists take sexual overperception to a whole new level. 
because they sexualize everything. They sexualize intimacy as well. Today, I will try to deal with, with the fraught question, why is the narcissist sexuality so distorted? His personality is distorted and disordered. His conduct is problematic. It seems that there is a kind of metastatic process that had invaded every dimension in his life, which is exactly what the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual says. But sex is a different domain and has a different etiology. Many narcissists grow up in families with mixed signals. You could have, for example, a mother who is asexual and a father who is promiscuous, or exactly the opposite, a father who is anti-sexual, for example, highly religious or highly traditional or highly conservative, and a mother who is a bit on the promiscuous and histrionic side. So there are mixed, there are mixed signals. When the child gets two seriously conflicting signals about sex, the child can't make, can't make up his mind. Many, many narcissists had received as children the message that sex is dirty and that all women are sluts. At the same time, mother was subtly incestuous. She touched the child inappropriately, maybe, or she confided in the child, rendering the child an effective intimate partner. So she parentified the child or she reacted to compliments and, or insults, even inadvertent, as a lover would, not as a mother should. So she reacted as, a, as an equal partner to anything the child said. In other words, she, the mother, entered the role of a, a companion. She abrogated, she abrogated her duties and her role and her functions as a mother in favor of maintaining an interaction with a child which is ambiently and emotionally incestuous and sometimes crosses the border into physical incest. Similarly, the father, and of course the roles can be reversed, let it be clear, the roles can be completely reversed. The father could have this usually with the daughter. But for clarity and simplicity's sake, I'm using a, a typical mother and father. So the father could be could be highly conservative, as I said, highly traditional, and so on. He, and he could broadcast to the child that sex is bad, sex is corrupting, sex is dangerous, sex is unhealthy, and so then the child is caught in the vice of these mixed signals because his mother sexualizes him, and his father is warning him against anything with a whiff of sex, with the remotest hint or association of sex. So how to interpret mother's behavior? Is she an enemy? Is she trying to corrupt? Is she trying to destroy? Is, it, is she trying to infect? Is she contagious? Is it a contagion? Is she a virus? Um, or is father wrong? And if father is wrong about this, Maybe he's wrong about many other things, so it undermines the father's authority and infallibility and the child's, the two pillars of the child's existence crumble. It's like Samson, Samson with the temple, you know, the two pillars crumble, the temple crumbles, the whole edifice, the whole edifice buries the child like in an earthquake or an explosion. It's a very, very traumatic state of things because the child doesn't know who to trust and who to believe, and who to adhere to, and who to follow. And so this kind of children grow up to be adults, and they develop Peter, Peter Pan syndrome, and they refuse to, to accept adult chores and adult responsibilities, and they become commitment, commitment phobes, they're afraid of commitment, we, we know all this. But a very important thing to realize is that this kind of children can relate to a woman, again, you can exchange the pronouns. When I say he, you can, when I say she, you can think he, when I say he, you can think she. But I don't want to encumber this video. So I'm going to use he and she, woman and man. Okay? Don't go all politically correct on me. 
and don't crucify me, the feminists among you. So, or the MGTOWs, or the Red Pillars, or whatever your, your insanity of the day is, insanity du jour. So, this kind of child can be with a woman in one of two ways. He can be with a woman as a child. In other words, he can, refer, he can relate to the woman as a substitute mother. If the woman is a long-time life partner, she gradually acquires mothering functions, nurturing functions, or the narcissist forces upon her, cajoles her, coerces her to behave like a mother, to become maternal. And so, of course, with a mother, it's inappropriate to have sex. It's incestuous, overtly incestuous. So the relationship becomes gradually asexual or sexless. So this is the first form of interaction that a narcissist from a home where he had received mixed signals, from a family that was dysfunctional in the sense that he received conflicting messages. Such a child will grow up to be an adult and he will have a sexless, sexless relationship with a maternal, mother-like, long-term, long intimate or life partner or companion. And the second way he can relate to women is a, prom is, is a promiscuous, incestuous, but very stern and disciplinarian father. So the woman in this case would be a disposable slut to be sexually despoiled, and verb, but at the same time, as he sexually despoils the woman, as he, as he treats her as a dispensable object, as he actually enacts incest with her because he is her father in his mind, he has a paternal mindset, at the same time, he verbally abuses her. And he verbally abuses her to discipline her for her own good. It's kind of tough love coupled with sex. So to summarize, when a child grows up in a mixed message home, he, he grows up to be an adult, and then he relates to women in one of two ways. Sex, as he has a sexless relationship with a mother figure, or he has an incestuous and promiscuous relationship with a slut. And then he verbally disciplines and abuses her for her own good. So when he loves a woman as he had loved his mother, as a long-term intimate partner, he loves her as a child. He renders himself asexual or sexless in order to avoid incest. And when he desires a throwaway woman, a disposable woman, a tissue woman, I call them, exactly like his father told him that sex is. His father broadcast to him that you should have sex only with dirty women. Sex is dirty. You should have sex with street women, with dirty women, with low life women, with low esteemed women, with trash. That's the only woman worth having sex with because you can't defile her more than she is. She's already dirty. She's already contaminated. So when he, when he desires this kind of adult, when he desires a throwaway woman, he transforms himself into a stern disciplinarian father, like his father had been. He hates women, this kind of adult. He hates women. He fears women, especially promiscuous women, especially sexualized women, especially self um, uh, histrionic women, seductive women, flirtatious women, teasing women. He hates these women and he's afraid of them. And so he sadistically despoils them, corrupts them, defiles them, dismantles them, dismembers them, and abuses them in every way. He pushes these women away, often towards other men, partly to reaffirm his view of women and for the other shoe to drop, as he fully anticipates this kind of woman is going to cheat on him. So why not, why not get it over with right now? Sometimes these narcissistic adults marry, get married, establish a family and a diet um, with the first type of woman. So they have a maternal relationship, sexless maternal relationship at home, and they dilly-dally and shilly-shally with wayward 
straying promiscuous women outside the home. And sometimes it's exactly the opposite. They're married. They're married to a promiscuous woman, a serial cheater, someone who would betray them, someone who would affirm and confirm their dim view of femininity, passed on to them by father. And outside the marriage of the dyad, they would form a relationship with a matronly maternal figure with whom usually they will not have sex. But narcissists always have two sets of women in their lives, maternal and promiscuous. Narcissists don't fantasize about sex, but about humiliating, trashing, despoiling, degrading, and demeaning, debasing, berating the woman, alone or with others. Narcissists are sexual sadists, group sex and threesomes. The narcissist doesn't derive pleasure from the sex act that takes place in an orgy or in a threesome. He derives a pleasure from observing, observing the way his woman, his wife, his spouse, his girlfriend is rendered a whore, a slut, by her liaison with another man. When he watches the woman in his life having sex with another man in such a setting, not as a cacold, he doesn't derive pleasure, the cacold derives pleasure. The narcissist's pleasure, the narcissist's gratification and edification is from the, from the debasement, despoiling, demeaning and besmirching of the woman, how she renders herself a slut at his service. Given the opportunity and the consent, some narcissists sexually assault. They become aggressive and violent. They engage in BDSM. Usually it's consensual because they're cowards. But it can easily, you know, cross the line when the woman, for example, is drunk. Conventional sex leads the narcissist to boredom. And many narcissists develop, develop erectile dysfunction if they engage, when they engage in traditional, conventional, possibly missionary sex. And again, they use group sex to spice up their lives, their sex lives, but not in a good way. They introduce other partners into the sex life, not in order to bond more closely with the woman, but, to, but in order to, to finally be able to regard her with full justification as a slut to humiliate the female. You see, narcissist to women is what a pedophile is to children, a sadistic monster. And so this creates... In every relationship with the narcissist, it creates divergent expectations. Most women cannot reconcile true intimacy and love with the narcissist's way of relating to them, especially sexually. The narcissist's sex broadcasts to the women, you're an object. You are something to, to destroy, to despoil, to dismantle. I'm going to have sadistic sex with you. I'm going, to, I'm going to hurt you via my sex. I'm going to make you do disgusting things. I'm going to force you to act against your will, against your values, your convictions, your wishes. I'm going to overtake you. I'm going to dominate you. I'm going to render you uh, an, an unthinking slut. Uh, I'm going to make you so submissive that you will vanish. And this doesn't sit well, of course, with true intimacy and love. And so the women are confused. The, there's a preclusion. The narcissist's sex precludes intimacy in love. But it doesn't start this way. In the, in the first stage, in the first phase, women usually indulge the narcissist sadistic sexuality. At first, when the attachment and when the bonding are minimal, because at the beginning they're minimal, women say, okay, what the heck? I'll give him what he wants. I'll play along. It's a role play. It will pass as we get more intimate, as we fall in love, as we establish a home, as we create a family, make a family, things will change and he will settle down. Or maybe if I, if I were to gratify his fantasies, he will no longer need them. He will have, he will have uh, kind of realized his dreams and now he will be able to move on and become a full-fledged 
adult with adult sexuality, which includes reciprocity and intimacy. So women, women engage in what I call malignant optimism. They, they keep hoping against hope that the narcissist initial expressed sexuality is an aberration. It's not the real him. It's just, you know, maybe an artifact of infatuation or because, because the woman is new to him and he wants to experiment with the body. They tell themselves, women tell themselves all kinds of stories and invented narratives. And they indulge a narcissist sexually. They collaborate. They play along. Whatever he asks them to do, they realize all his fantasies, never mind how repulsive to them and how they are disgusted by it. Or even, um, never mind how morally reprehensible they find some of the requests. And of course, this has the effect. This acquiescence, this submissiveness, this compliance, this has the effect of amplifying and solidifying the narcissist's attachment and bonding. The narcissist says, wow, I found the love of my life. I found the woman of my life. She does everything I ask her to do. Whatever my wish is, whatever my fantasy is, she realizes it. She never says no. She's wonderful. She's the one I've been waiting for. And he gets very attached and bonded with her, precisely because she is indulging him. Now, she is indulging him because she hopes he will change. And he gets attached to her because he hopes she will never change. That leads to the second phase. The second phase is when the woman gives up the ghost. I mean, she says, enough is enough. You know, it's been one year, it's been two years, it's been three years. We've been playing all kinds of dirty games. You know, anything from water sports to threesomes. And I've had enough. I want to have normal, loving, reciprocated, intimate, warm, accepting sex. Finally, I want him to tell me I love you with his body. I don't want this anymore. I don't want the objectifying, cold, calculated, schematic sex that he has in mind. I don't want to, to become an, an object. I don't want to be used all the time. And I want to enjoy a bit, you know, I'm not enjoying this. So as the woman gets, as the woman gets more attached and more bonded to the narcissist, and of course, time spent together, time spent together tends to induce attachment and bonding. The more time she spends with the narcissist, the more she bonds, bonds with him, the more she gets attached to him, because she sees his tender sides, his, ch his childlike side, sides, aspects, the childlike aspects of his personality. She sees, you know, no one is 100% bad. Sometimes there are good moments, sometimes there are tender moments, and, and she gets attached, she gets bonded, especially because she wants to get attached and bonded. She's so lonely, she's waited for so long, and he looks to be perfect. He looks to be the perfect partner. Don't forget, it starts with love bombing, with grooming. I mean, she's, she's absolutely within a shared fantasy and a shared psychosis. She doesn't see reality, she doesn't see the world, and above all, she doesn't see him. She, says, she sees not him, but what he represents for her. She sees herself in him. She likes the way he sees her. And so she can't let go. It's addictive. It's absolutely addictive. And she gets very attached and very bonded, unusually so, actually. But when she does, she really, really wants to be loved. She really wants to be held. She really wants to be understood and listened to. She really wants her emotional needs to be catered to. She wants empathy. She wants warmth. She wants acceptance. She wants to see in his eyes the glint of love. And so then, in this second phase, women demand to revert to conventional, intimate, adult sex, to reciprocate. They suddenly refuse to have the narcissist kind of sex, which is impersonal, objectifying, dehumanizing, sadistic. They want to put a stop to it. Enough is enough. No more threesomes. No more water sports. No more disgusting acts. You know, I want to have, I want to make love, not to have sex. And so the second phase, while in the first phase, the woman indulges the narcissist. In the second phase, phase, she cuts off his kind of sex. She no longer collaborates 
with his sexual fantasies and demands. And this leads to stage three. At this point, the narcissist is pissed off. He feels deceived. He feels furious because for years or for months, she had given him exactly what he wanted. Every fantasy was hers. She shared his every, his, his every kink, his every predilection. <clears throat> she agreed to be tied. She agreed to be subjected to various physical acts, which are unmentionable, at least on YouTube. And so suddenly she cuts it off. That's unfair. He feels that she had been manipulating him and deceiving him. So he develops sex aversion or even erectile dysfunction. He doesn't want her anymore. His body is rejecting her. His mind is furious. His body is, is becoming dysfunctional. And he can't do it anymore. He doesn't have erection, to cut a long story short. The relationship is rendered increasingly more and more sexless, sexless and disintimate. There is a vein of aggression, underlying aggression. As the narcissist begins to digest, the things are not going to be the same. That she is an independent, autonomous entity. Person, a person with her own wishes and fears, with her own preferences, with her own predilections and her own proclivities. And this separateness is very threatening to him because it implies abandonment anxiety. And of course, it's a vicious circle. Because of this, he withdraws. As he withdraws, intimacy declines, sex ceases altogether, and now she has an incentive. She definitely has an incentive to find an alternative, for example, to cheat on him. The attachment and the bonding weaken, not only on her part, but on his part, because the narcissist begins to, to, to put distance between him and the woman he begins to realize that he's going to lose her, that she's going to hurt him and abandon him and cheat on him. So he begins to preemptively abandon her and reject her. He says to himself, I'm going to reject her before she rejects me. I'm going to abandon her before she even thinks of it. She's going to cheat on me. I'm going to cheat on her. This is a bit like borderline. And by the way, I'm not the guy who suggested that borderline is failed narcissism. That was a scholar by the name of Grotstein. I'm just quoting him. Okay? So narcissists have these borderline features, preemptive abandonment and, and so on and so forth. And so when they, when a sexual chill sets in, because the woman no longer, would no longer collaborate in his delirious uh, wishes, it is then that the narcissist begins to withdraw and he begins to regard the relationship as a chore and the woman as a nuisance. Why? Because he's not getting his sexual needs and desires met. That, by the way, is a totally normal reaction. Everyone would react this way. And then the stage four, cheating or breakup or both. The narcissist is still attached and still bonded if uh, there are enough maternal elements in the mix. Even a promiscuous woman can be very maternal. So there, it's always a mix. Even a maternal woman can cheat. It's always a mix. But the level of maternal, I mean, what's the percentage of maternal elements determines the extent of attachment and bonding. So at this stage, which is the last stage, stage four, the narcissist is still attached, he's still bonded, he still refuses to let go of the woman, of her maternal, of the maternal, of uh, the expression of her maternal instincts. She takes care of him, he is loved in his mind unconditionally, and he refuses to, to let the woman go free, he refuses to set her free. And it is, it is at this stage that many narcissists become erotomanic stalkers or very jealous, romantically jealous. They begin to spy on their spouses. They begin to micromanage and micro-control their spouse's existence and being. They limit the freedoms that they hitherto had given their, their uh, partners. And so 
Stage four is a very conflicted stage because attachment and bonding abate. They go down. They go down on the part of the woman because she feels that the narcissist's sexuality signifies a lack of intimacy and a lack of true love. Bonding and attachment abate with the narcissist because he feels frustrated, he feels aggressive, he feels deceived when the woman refuses to cater to his sexual fantasies. And so with both of them, there's a reduction, reduction in phase two attachment and bonding. It's not what it used to be, the couple. And many times they try to break up, the narcissist and his woman. They try to break up. They agree on, on the period of separation or they, they agree to an open marriage or, or they effectively separate. The narcissist absents himself. He becomes, I don't know, a workaholic. Or the woman starts to, to travel a lot or go on separate vacations. I mean, there are attempts to somehow wind up the whole business. But these attempts are not working well, mainly as a narcissist is residually attached to the woman as a mother, as a mother, and won't let go. And similarly, the woman is residually attached to the narcissist, owing to the paternal, disciplinarian, strict and stern emanations and communications from the narcissist. The woman has daddy issues, the narcissist has mummy issues, and they complement each other perfectly. They cater to these missing parental figures in their lives. And there's always the hope that this time is going to work. This time it's going to work because mommy loves me and daddy just wants what's good for me. Tough love is okay as long as it's love. And so women stay and narcissists stay and they try again dysfunctionally and it only gets worse with time. And of course, some women are exploitative in the they remain in the relationship for financial reasons. They render services, but they're free. Uh, otherwise, they, they behave as virtual sing singles. They are free to cheat serially and indiscreetly, or they triangulate ostentatiously, or they try to terminate their stalking by teaming up with other men, or and so on. But all in all, narcissists are forced to choose between loveless sex with dispensable, disposable women, or sexless love with true intimate partners and companions, but, but these partners and companions are actually substitute, substitute mothers. In both cases, loveless sex and sexless love, the narcissist is likely to endure mortifying betrayal. It's a very sad situation. The narcissist cannot exit from the matrix and the template of his childhood, nor can uh, his woman, his wife, his spouse, his, his partner. We are all, when we interact within romantic relationships, we all hark back. We all rely on these internalized templates and we can't truly get rid of them. And there's no exception with the narcissist and his and his partner and the narcissist doesn't have doesn't have really other options because the narcissist doesn't have a healthy sex drive the most narcissists are not actually promiscuous and they're not actually addicted to sex even somatic narcissists whose whole life is sex you know they are they are sex, sexual braggarts. They, they brag about how many sex, sexual events. It's actually not about sex. It's about conquest. It's about narcissistic supply. And so narcissist's relationship with sex is very confounded and, and problematic. Most narcissists, I would say, if I had to generalize, most narcissists are actually asexual, even somatic narcissists, that you do something, that you engage in an act, doesn't mean that it reflects internal motivation or relevant psychodynamic. The, it's, it's very important. The etiology, the, the psychological reasoning is very important. Why does the somatic narcissist 
Why is he so preoccupied with sex? He doesn't see the, the women he sleeps with. He doesn't see them. For him, they are sex, sex dolls. And if it's a woman, the, the, the men, if it's a histrionic woman or a seductive flirtation, the men are animated dildos. The somatic narcissist masturbates with female bodies. Uh, watch the previous video that I posted today. It's very relevant. These narcissists reduce their partners, their sexual partners, to body parts. That's why narcissists are humongous consumers of pornography. Because in pornography, the participants are reduced to body parts. And 40% of pornographic imagery in films focus on body parts, not on the entire body or, the, or let alone personality. Narcissists are asexual. And so if you are a cerebral narcissist, you will use faithfulness as an excuse why you're not sleeping with women. I'm faithful to my wife. That's why I'm not interested in women. They're intimidated. They fear women. They hate women. They, they dread uh, female sexuality. And, and uh, of course, they are biological entities, so they're also attracted. There's always a conflict. And so their solution, the solution of narcissists, both somatic and cerebral, when they can't reconcile the physical, biological attraction with their state of mind of hating women, fearing women, dreading women, female sexuality, when they have to put these two together, their solution is sadistic despoiling. They confuse sadistic despoiling with sex. When children get a new toy or a new radio, you know, at the time, they dismantled it. They wanted to see what's inside. They broke it apart. Narcissists do the same to women. They dismantle them. They want to see what makes them tick. Where's the inner mechanism? You know, they despoil the woman. They dismantle, dismember the woman. They confuse and conflate sadistic despoiling with sex. But that's why sex with a narcissist resembles rape psychologically. It's about power, subjugation, hatred, fear, and envy. There's no trace of love or intimacy. The narcissist reserves love and intimacy for other types of interactions within the relationship, even when the partner is loved, and even when there is intimacy, when the partner is intimate. The narcissist would segregate, sequester, isolate the sexual aspect from everything else. He could be, the narcissist could be loving and intimate and supportive and the most wonderful partner when it comes to other issues. But when it comes to sex and true adult intimacy, he is a child in the worst sense of the word. Sex, excluding masturbation or despoiling kink, sex is a physical activity with, with, with attendant, attendant dimensions. For the narcissist, Sex induces, creates performance anxiety. And so he has to relate in sex to another full-fledged organism. And it, it, it makes him very anxious. He is also always comparing himself with others. It's very typical of a narcissist to, to ask the, the partner, how many orgasms did I give you? Did you ever have this before? Am I not the best you ever had? So many narcissists finally settle on masturbation. It's a fully controlled object, you know, their own bodies. And so with this fully controlled object, they could have regulated, well-regulated sexuality. And the poor narcissist cannot, is not even really interested in casual sex. You know, casual sex is a pressure valve. It's an interim solution between between regular partners. And in this sense, it's very laudable. I'm all for it. I, I just regret that people think of casual sex as meaningless, because sex is never meaningless. But casual sex, one night stand or whatever, is a great solution, at least biologically and physiologically, if not psychologically, but it's a great solution when you don't have a partner. But the narcissist is incapable even of this, even of this. Why? Because casual sex, first of all, requires investment. You have to invest. Even if it's one hour, even if it's a few drinks, you have to invest. 
You have to pretend that you're interested in the partner. You have to listen. You have to talk a little. You have to have some good time. You know, casual sex doesn't happen in the air. Unless you go to some sex club or some impersonal setting where actually everyone masturbates using other people's bodies. It's not sex. But casual sex with a partner requires investment. And the narcissist for the narcissist to invest in other people is wasteful. He feels, he feels um, that his time is wasted, his resources are wasted. He feels, he feels that it's very unjust and, and it irritates him that he has to invest in other people. Also, it's impossible with a casual sex partner to realize any kinky or humiliation fantasies. Literally impossible. I mean, of course, you may come across accidentally one in a million uh, sexual partner who are like you, or if you go to a specific club, there, there are BDSM clubs and so on, there you can pick up the appropriate partner. But generally, on a typical rendezvous of casual sex, when you go to a bar and you pick up a woman, she's very unlikely to collaborate with you in your basest, basest, uh, most humiliating and degrading and despoiling and demeaning fantasies. Very unlikely. So it's not gratifying. And it causes narcissistic injury. It causes narcissistic injury because after the casual sex, you are disposable. The woman doesn't want to see you again. Doesn't want to talk to you again. It's humiliating. So narcissists are not natural candidates for casual sex. This body, personality, sex, sexuality are not satisfied. They need to dominate the female. They need to reduce the female to unthinking submission brought on by unrequited and tantalizing craving. They need to make the woman act in ways that she would find shameful, hurtful, denigrating, and guilt-inducing. And obviously, none of these can be accomplished in a brief, almost anonymous encounter. Grooming requires time, effort, careful planning and preparations, repeated exposure. Regular relationship sex with a partner requires intimacy, an inordinate and wasteful investment of resources. So it's also a problem. The sole interest of a narcissist lies in objectifying, humiliating, degrading and despoiling the woman. Sex is just one way of accomplishing this. Sex is the physical equivalent, the bodily equivalent of verbal abuse. It's a form of abuse. So as far as a narcissist is concerned, sex is just another mode of abuse. He has no interest in sex except when and if it lets him corrupt the woman, denigrate her, humiliate her, or use her body to masturbate with, and then dumped. Otherwise, sex totally fails to arouse the narcissist. And so that's why sex withholding, withholding sex, is another form of sexual sadism. The aim is to frustrate and to hurt the woman by rejecting her, by humiliating her to the core. And when the woman makes demands, when she criticizes, disagrees, gives advice, gets too intimate, too comfy with the, with the narcissist, it destroys his sex drive because it makes true sadism impossible. And, and remember, narcissists are into sadism, not into sex. Sadism requires unmitigated domination. Sa sadism requires information asymmetry and distance. So making demands, talking, interacting, uh, criticizing, arguing, knowing the narcissist, getting to know the narcissist, up close, humanizing the narcissist, all these imply equipotence. They imply equality. And equality is the antidote to sadism. You can't be sadistic with an equal partner. And so this is stage four. And some women immediately cut off the narcissist as a sexual partner. Others cheat. Others remain in the relationship but abandon the narcissist effectively with another man. Others um, become service providers or business partners or roommates. There are all kinds of arrangements. Even open marriage sometimes is agreed. All kinds of arrangements. But in any case, whatever the arrangement is, attachment is gone, bonding is gone, and the two parties are actually absent. They're absent either physically or emotionally, and typically both. And women try everything before they reach stage four. Uh, some of them even try to spice up the sex life 
with group sex and so on. I've seen women do, women, not men, do absolutely everything. Um, in the narcissist's mind, it is okay to foster expectations and then frustrate them. It is okay to promise commitment and then not keep the promise. It's okay to affect other people's lives irreversibly and irrevocably and then simply disappear and withdraw and ghost them. Why it's okay? Because it is sadistic. It is proof positive of the narcissist's power. You see, she's after me. She's stalking me. She's addicted to me. But demands, so this is expectations. Demands, real intimacy, they destroy the sadistic fantasy and they make sadistic practice impracticable. Many narcissists actually prefer sadistic supply to narcissistic supply. They would sacrifice narcissistic supply if they can get sadistic supply. Sadistic supply implies a much bigger power asymmetry. You're more godlike. You're more godlike when you have the power to hurt. Anyone can love Anyone can, you know, but few people can, can truly cause pain. God can cause pain. God punishes. So, sadistic supply is of a higher, higher grade, higher quality than narcissistic supply. So, you see many times, narcissist, for example, gives up sex. A woman offers sex and he rejects her. He wouldn't take the sex, even if he's attracted to the woman very much. He desires her, craves her badly, but he would still frustrate her. Because not having sex with her is sadistic supply. Having sex with her is run-of-the-mill narcissistic supply. It's low-grade. High-grade heroin is sadistic supply. And uh, a woman to the narcissist is a figure, an artifact, an object. And again, this is very similar to the way that pedophiles are attracted to immature children's bodies. The woman's body is a fetish. Watch the video I posted earlier today about fetishes and fetishism. The entire human body is a fetish. To be ruined, degraded, played with, toyed with, dismantled, soiled, despoiled. I mean, it's, a, it's a, an object to be tossed around, bumped and bounced. And the entire body becomes like a single object. It's like a classic fetishist. They admire, I mean, they are sexually attracted and aroused by body parts. So a classic fetishist would be aroused by feet, or by boobs, or by shoes, or by panties or bras. The narcissist fetishizes the entire body of his partner. The body becomes a fetish. And the narcissist is sadistic, not only sexually, that's the problem. He's also a psychological sadist. So the sexual sadism is an echo, it's a reflection and a resonance of much deeper psychological trends and tides and rivers and streams. You can't dissociate, disengage and disentangle the two. When we are faced with a classical sexual sadist, many serial killers are actually sexual sadists, Hannibal Lecter types, their sexual sadism is pretty segregated pretty separate from their general psychological makeup. And so the sexual sadism can be isolated and tackled. With a narcissist, it's a much bigger problem. And in this sense, by the way, Hannibal Lecter is a narcissist. Because Hannibal Lecter is a psychological sadist. He derives a huge amount of pleasure from the way, from the preparation for the sex, before the sex, from the foreplay. So, in the narcissist, there's a confluence of psychological sadism and sexual sadism. How do you treat this? Withholding is a form of sadism. Coercion and imposing are forms of sadism. Taunting, tantalizing, teasing, frustrating. All of these are forms of sadism. And there are... And this sexual sadism limits, limits the space of possible sexual partners. When it comes to a lifelong partner or intimate partner, the, narcissi the narcissist is promiscuous. Anyone who can provide him with supply, with narcissistic supply, 
can become the narcissist's intimate partner. It is a myth, nonsensical myth, that narcissists are attracted only to specific types of women, codependents, or this is total trash, unsupported by research. Narcissists are attracted to absolutely anyone and everyone who provide them with narcissistic supply or has the potential to provide them with narcissistic supply. That's why many narcissists end up with other narcissists in a couple. But when it comes to sex, it is true that there is type preference, there's mate selection. Narcissists react to two types of women in sex. Women who are submissive and are already deeply in love or irresistibly infatuated with the narcissist. And these women require grooming to be brought to this stage. But having been groomed, these are, they become, they are rendered sexually attractive. And the second type of women, promiscuous masochists. This kind of women you can find in sex clubs, private networks, or even in bars. It takes a lot of effort to find these women if you also insist on fulfilling your fantasies. And there are huge risks involved, medical and personal. So narcissists usually go for type 1, not for type 2. They groom. Women in casual sex, as I said before, would never agree to realize the narcissist's sexual fantasies. Such women also demand equipotence, negotiated power symmetry. They want to be gratified in sex. They have demands. Um, so most narcissists actually avoid casual sex and one night stands. It's very narcissistically injurious. It's unfulfilling and it provokes performance anxiety. And, and finally, the narcissist is discarded. The woman doesn't want to have any, anything further to do with it. So it's, it's humiliation. It's perceived as rejection. So narcissists look for, for number one. A woman who can be groomed into infatuation via massive sublimation. Uh, that's the, the clinical term. Problem is that a woman who can be groomed requires an intimate, committed relationship. And the narcissist is not willing to embark on such a relationship or truly provide it. So he fakes. He lies, simply. False promises, pretensions of commitment, and then it creates approach, avoidance, repetition, compulsion. He approaches, then he panics, he avoids, he runs away, comes back, runs away. He's looking for an admirer, a playmate, a lover, mother. He wants a shared fantasy. He's not looking for a wife. He doesn't want to become a father. He doesn't want to establish a family. And he doesn't want to buy a home. He deceives the woman. He makes false promises, to the contrary, in order to secure the three S's. Sex, supply, services. And yes, sometimes the narcissist would go as far as getting married to such a woman, so as to secure her cooperation, but then the marriage is a sham. And so this is the this is the background, um, the background to to the narcissist sexuality. Add to this the fact that the narcissist is no empathy and that the narcissist is amoral, has no morality. In other words, the narcissist has not been socialized to, internalized, to internalize moral and social mores and addicts, edic, edicts and so on. The narcissist, in other words, is not constrained. He's not religious, he's not moral, he has no values. Uh, and if he's psychopathic, he's merely goal-oriented. Um, Add, add these into the mix, and narcissists become seriously dangerous. Seriously dangerous, um, because what you see is not what you get. All women, even extreme subs, submissive women, they hate, hate sadistic sex. They're disgusted by it. And all of them, ultimately, will want something deeper. And so at some point, the narcissist is going to be trapped by his own promises and the expectations he had fostered. And then he would project, would externalize his aggression, and he would punish the woman for reminding him that he's a liar. You know? There's no winning in this game. You must understand this. 
Do not think that anyone can teach you any strategy or technique. Or... No contact if you can. It's painful. It's heartbreaking. Better to be with a broken heart than with no heart at all. The narcissist is a phantasm. It's a fata morgana. It's a mirage. It's not there. There's no water in the oasis. And the palm tree that is growing is a figment. Don't rush or the desert will swallow you.